Hey everybody, welcome once again to Rise of the GM, where today we're talking about encountering a cursed family. We're going to talk about an NPC that is a sadistic priest, and we're going to talk about what it means to tie in PC backstories as a GM. All that and more here on Rise of the GM. Well, hey Adam, we are back again. Now this one... Uh, this episode today is actually a pre-recorded episode uh, that we recorded a few weeks ago, uh, dropping today on April 4th. And uh, as we're we're doing this, I just want to remind everybody that even though this is pre-recorded because I am on a sabbatical, uh, Adam is actually in the comments right now. So if you want to get on and uh, participate and comment and give your ideas and your thoughts about the things that we're talking about, Adam will be there typing and talking with you. We may not be responding here on the video because it's pre-recorded, right. but he is there. So definitely jump in and be part of the conversation. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, this is... Uh, this is a, a time where we don't know exactly how we're going to be. I started to say, how are you doing today, Adam, uh -huh, here uh -huh, in the future? Uh -huh. How do you think you'll be doing? I, it's going to be awesome. Today is so <laughs> great. As you're listening to this, it's amazing. The, the weather that. we think is definitely weather of some sort yes. out there. It's <laughs> going to be sometime somewhere in the 60s to 90s range. Ooh, and there 60s could be to 90s. 60s and 90s, somewhere in that realm. Um, it's possible that it snowed, but it's also possible that it's super sunny and beautiful and hammock weather. You know, I hope that it is warm because at this point in my sabbatical um, on August or August on April 9th, I'm going to yeah. be heading to Turkey Run for myself uh, by myself for about a week of just mm. kind of solitude, hiking, reading and uh, writing yeah. and all the stuff that goes along with that. And then a few weeks later, I'm going to the Smoky Mountain National Park oh, yeah. with my family. We're going to camp for a week, be in a cabin for a week awesome. and a half there. And that should be good time. So I'm hoping that it is, it is great and awesome weather. Not in yeah. the 90s. I don't want it that hot. I want yeah. it to be like no, no, 60s, no, no. 70s. That's where I'm yeah. looking. Sweet spot. Yeah. So, but Just right now, covering all my bases, you know. Right now, you guys, this mm -hmm. is April 4th. Yep. And uh, hopefully uh, you had a good April Fool's Day a few days ago and didn't Ooh. get fooled too bad. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, we're going to jump in today. We have our encounter like we usually have, and uh, we'll tie up with our NPC like we usually do. And in the middle, we're going to talk about PC backstories. That's going to be great. But That's let's right. start with our encounter. And Adam's going to read that today. I will. I will. Yeah. Um, yeah. Again, this is from Eureka from Gnome Stew. Um, this is a family affair. The PCs are attacked by an earth elemental, and upon defeating the creature, they find a large medallion within the mound of dirt that formed its body. It appears to be made of a polished black stone etched with an elemental symbol of the earth. This medallion is a cursed item, and it can't be removed by normal means after it is put on, nor can it be easily destroyed. If a PC puts on the amulet, the PC's skin slowly transforms into a mixture of earth and rock. After four weeks of wearing this, the PC's mind is completely destroyed and she becomes an earth elemental. The earth elemental was protecting the hidden entrance to an elementalist tomb. Upon entering the tomb, the PCs are attacked by an air elemental that uses its gusts of wind to slam them against stone columns and walls. Hovering within the creature is another medallion with similar properties. It turns its wearer into an air elemental. Deeper inside the tomb... Uh, is a water elemental residing in a room that has a small hole has small holes in the walls, floor and ceiling. This elemental attacks by hitting the PCs with a geyser that erupts from the holes, quickly draining down to the floor to attack again from another surface. This elemental also possesses a medallion. The final confrontation is with the fire elemental that protects the elementalist casket. The fire elemental is the most dangerous foe, for during battle it burns with such intense heat that the iron and wood supports of the tomb weaken and the structure begins to collapse. Another cursed medallion is found once the creature is defeated. A PC that wears the cursed medallion knows that the elementals were a family. The PC also instinctively knows that in order to break the curse, all four medallions must be recovered and laid to rest in the casket. If any PCs are wearing amulets, touching the casket will work just as well for them. 
If no one is wearing an amulet, the PCs must somehow deduce how to destroy the amulets in order to prevent others from falling under their curse. So this is a family affair. Wow. So much yeah. good stuff in this one. So much. Yeah, yeah. First of all, you could see me nodding while you read that when it said that if someone puts on this amulet that uh, they can't get it off and it's hard to destroy by hard to destroy. I pretty much chalk that up to wish. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's the only way. Otherwise, you've got a PC who's going to die in four weeks, right? Yeah, right. Their brain's right. going to be destroyed and they're going to turn into this thing. Unless, of course, it seems at the end that they can get rid of it by even if they're wearing them, like touching the coffin, right? But uh, just as you read this, so the first one, I, I didn't really have much of a thought. Just like a normal battle, they're fighting this earth elemental. Yeah, and right. they probably would and try to kill it. And then they find this amulet. Then it all comes down to, at this point, there's a, a little fork in the road. Do they just take the amulet and like go to sell it? Or do mm. they put it on? If they yeah, put right. it on, then they will know that there are more and that the only way for this character not to die and become an elemental is to go back fight the rest and and get to the end right right uh, yeah because yeah. it said if they if they've worn it they'll know how it'll be destroyed mm -hmm. they go in i love this air elemental uh, because it, you know it said you know the air elemental knocks them into columns or whatever so in my mind this is like prime for like making a, a location that is well remembered uh yeah, yeah. i see them like entering down into this hall that is like hundreds of feet like as far as you can see in every direction there's all these like columns uh in yeah. parallel lines lining up uh -huh. and it's like they don't know what it is and it's kind of dark and eerie and it's not until they get into the center of this room as they're crossing it that the air elemental shows up and then it's just slamming them like pinballs through all of these yeah. columns that are sticking like <laughs> bing 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 and it's like uh -huh. uh, i can see it happening fast and fun and like yeah, them yeah. having to figure out how do we stop this then they get through that and they get to this water elemental. Love this one too. Holes in the ceiling, holes in the floor. And in my mind, did you ever see old, uh, No Country for Old Men? Mm, I don't movie, think so. Movie about yeah. a true sociopath who, okay. who goes around with this uh, hog slaughter. It's like this uh, air gun that, that uh, you, mm. when you put it, this metal thing hits. Yeah. Anyway, I see these, these uh, water things coming through like that and hitting them in the head and not necessarily killing them like in, right, that, yeah, in yeah. that movie, but like this idea that yeah, the damage is fast and precise and it's just like pop, 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 pop and yeah, there's yeah. water and then it drains out and they're like, what do we do? You know, and again, they uh -huh. have to figure it out because this room locked as soon as you went in. There doesn't seem to be a way out <laughs> until you defeat them. And then you finally right. get out and the, the fire, when they say is the most dangerous because it's causing collapse of the actual tomb itself. When I first read that, I thought it was like, the casket uh, oh no yeah you mean like right, the whole right. structure this underground structure they're in is beginning to uh collapse because it's you know burning the wood and the metal and so they have to figure out how to defeat all four of these and then who knows my guess is they would only put on one uh, because somebody would think oh this is a cool thing and then uh they probably wouldn't put on the rest but if they do then they have to uh, do the ceremony in order to not be turned into an elemental. Also, uh, the idea that like, what if they didn't go back and what if they didn't complete getting all four or what, you know, what if yeah, right. they have somebody who has on this amulet that's going to turn them into this mindless elemental? You know, as a, yeah, P, as a GM, you have to be ready for things that your PC might actually die in your game and roll up another character and this this could be a place although doubtful because if one of them puts it on they know kind of what they have to get through right so anyway yeah, i talked yeah, a right. lot about this because nah. it was like such an exciting sounding encounter to me mm. what did you think when you read this yeah i again i feel like i say this every time but i really i really do love this encounter and i, I like those layers of it and that just like going deeper that there are there are those questions for me of like, what if they, you know, the, the initial question I guess I had was like, how is this like getting dropped into your game? Uh, you know, kind of thing. Cause this, mm -hmm. this is leading into this elementalist tomb. Um, and maybe, you know, maybe there is a thing of like, there's a, uh, you know, a job given like, Hey, uh, there is a, this crazy earth elemental terrorizing the countryside. We need somebody to go take care of this. And then the party, you know, like goes and destroys it and they find the medallion and they're like, Oh, there's a, 
door over there in the side of the hill, you know, and then you, it like leads in that way, or is it just something that they, you know, find as they're kind of exploring and that kind of stuff. But, um, I do ask that question of like, you know, would the group go deeper in, you know, and what do you do if, if they just like take the amulet and go and sell it, I guess it's like, well, it's out of their hands this, and we're moving on, you know, kind this of is where as the GM, I would put a slight nudge. I don't okay. always do yeah. this, but yeah. if they, they would probably try to identify this before selling it so they could know what they're selling. Mm -hmm. And instead of just saying, uh, it's an amulet that will turn the wear into an earth elemental, which might sound bad. Mm -hmm. I would probably word it in such a way. It's like, it seems to be a, uh, a long forgotten, uh, relic. It's a metal yeah, yeah. that, uh, gives its wearer the power of an earth elemental. Well, yeah, it gives them the power because it turns them because into. <laughs> I wouldn't say turns them into. I would say gives them yeah, the yeah, power yeah. because right, there's yeah. somebody in that party that's going to be uh, like, "I love being big and strong. Give me that." Yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah, <laughs> and they put it on, and then only when they put it on and can't take it off and and yeah. can't destroy it, right. and have that knowledge that pulls them into the rest of it. That pulls them into knowing. Yeah, wait, there's a temple here, and we've got. We were at the door. Evidently, this thing was guarding the door. We got to find it. Right. And then we find it and we got to fight these things, you know, that by then yeah, they're being sure. pulled by the necessity. So yeah, yeah. it's kind of in the wording of how you let them identify Absolutely. it because they're going to try and identify it. Uh -huh. Just don't want to make them think that this is a cursed item. You want them to think this right. is like, yeah. awesome. But they, they could be, you know, you could have a band of like wizards who are like, we'll just sell this thing. Identify. <laughs> and in that case, it's just not going to happen, I guess. Yeah, right. And well, I was thinking about that too, though. That's that's one where, you know, for, for me, if I was doing that, then it becomes, I, I do think I would be like trying to give the nudges of, hey, let's do this. But like our, our current table on Thursday nights typically <laughs> is anti doing what Adam hopes for, you know, kind of thing. And, um, and, uh, you got to be more sly and subtle. Yeah, yeah. Got to be more sly. So, um, so I could see, you know, that happening in some ways, but, but that's like kind of a long, slow burn in some ways too. I think it could come back even if, even if the group is like, we're taking some dalian, no one's putting it on. There's no, no stinking way we're putting this around our neck. We're going to take it. And it's like, well, okay, you sold it off. And next time you're in this area, there is now a, an earth elemental that is destroying things in this town because you did this. And now you have to deal with this. A second time and go figure it out you know like there here's may be another some... way i mean i like that yeah. because they're like what the heck we took care of this yeah. or somebody they met that was a friend of theirs an npc comes to them in a panic mm -hmm. it's like i was trying to like get something so i could be more powerful and help out with what we're doing yeah. whatever that is I bought this amulet that they said just came in. Uh, the, the guy who identified it said it like would give you the power of an earth elemental. I put it yep, on and now yep. I can't take it off. And here's the thing. I've got to go down and get the, you know, can you guys help me? You know, yeah, it could yeah. could be something yeah. like that. Yeah. So Maybe. it could be a slow burn uh -huh, or it could uh -huh. be like a help, a help burn. Yeah, That's yeah, not right, burn. right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe an NPC from a character's backstory could come into there and do Ooh, that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, a question I have, uh, is what are your thoughts on cursed items? Speaking of cursed items, I don't mind them. <laughs> <laughs> Explain. <laughs> I like things that are going to give my, my MPC or my NPCs, my PCs mm -hmm. trouble. Um, yeah. because I feel like overcoming struggle is like, the game right it's yeah. like in life if if everything were just like easy it wouldn't be that fun it's when things are hard and you overcome and mm -hmm. so a cursed item now i don't necessarily want a cursed item that's going to kill them like outright yeah. just like immediately like you touch this it cuts off your head you're dead you know i want them to be able to i don't to know have if choice. i agree with that but <laughs> <laughs> okay so i've done that once or twice uh, but anyway <laughs> on the whole I, I like to give them a little more choice in that, that they can find a way to, to uh, mitigate yeah, right, that right, curse right. thing, to get rid of that curse thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I, in one of my games, I'm trying to remember if it was the dormant mind or, or what, it, I remember Eric's character got a cursed sword that, oh. were, that caused him to pull it out and he failed to save and end up just killing a child in the street. And yeah, like his Oracle character was a, 
his character was a good character mm-hmm. and yeah. like that was like hard on him yeah, yeah, and it yeah. was like he had to figure out what to do about this sword and i can't remember i can't even remember what happened but i remembered that it was like almost devastating to him that he failed that save and he killed this right like, innocent child yeah and like yeah. that was like heavily weighing on him because he was like a good character and so uh i think throwing in some of those conundrums are are fun mm-hmm. from time to time so yeah. yeah i mean i don't mind having cursed items show up it's not like every item is going to be cursed and not every item is going to be like blessed there's going to be a lot mm-hmm. of items that are just you know, in the middle, they're just stuff. Yeah, but, right, uh, right. I think throwing in an occasional curse one and throwing in one that maybe begins to influence my characters, but the there's the, on one hand, they get power, and on the other hand, it's making them more evil, and they yeah, have right. to make decision, you know? Mm-hmm. We've yeah. got a guy in, in the Dormant Mind campaign who has this uh, armor of skulls made from mm-hmm. the skull of a great serpent that is evil, and it's yeah. intelligent, and... He's been wearing it uh, with not what seems like a lot of consequences yet, but there may be some consequences that start happening yet. to that. Yet. <laughs> yet being the key term there. If he's watching this, he's going to be like, oh, I love that armor, but he's going to mm-hmm. maybe have to decide. And of course, he's already proved that he loves playing evil characters. So I don't know <laughs> that there's going to be much of a sure. moral dilemma in his mind. He's going to be like, sounds good. My guy just went evil, everybody. <laughs> Um, yeah, I have a like in the current game, um, it's like intelligent slash possessed sword, you know, uh-huh. that's, that's out there, and I, everybody knows that that's in the game. Um, but it's it was like I think Pip Pip had that and had like a essentially lead box with enchantments f- made and then just threw it in there and locked it down. I'm like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I'm not having this. Um, oh wait! So. Well, you have another one that uh, was a good sword. Yes, that, it was also a good sword. Yeah. yeah. The one character who the character I'm talking about who is evil was trying and trying to get me to yep. give it to him. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm like, this is not. That's not going to go yeah, well. So I gave work. that to Pip, and he's yeah. using that yeah, one. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, Pip has all the enchanted swords. What's the deal? <laughs> yeah, he's just collecting them. I I do like uh, I like intelligent items a lot i love that idea i remember mm-hmm. being like a player and like th- doing playing 3.5 and seeing like the idea of an intelligent item for the first time and just being like right. my mind is like, blown you know kind of thing so loving this um, idea that there's something that has its own will yeah and yeah may or may not throw in with you right all the time yep. yeah <laughs> yeah yeah so it's it's cool but I, I i like the idea of cursed items as long i think you know, you were talking about it being like a story element and not something you're just like completely messing over your people right. at all times. It's not like, oh, you put those boots on and now you have a five speed for the rest of the game. Sorry, you know, kind of thing. I, I don't right. think I would want that to be a long term kind of situation, but um, I do like the the way that this plays out in this encounter and um, we're kind of getting off of that. But a kind of a practical thing for this encounter, you know, if you were going to run this out there, if you're a GM that's like, I really want to use this. Um, you know, this maybe goes without saying, but have stats for some elementals ready <laughs> to like, not, I mean, not only like you running them in the fight, but like, if your players are going to be turning into elementals, you may want to, you know, have that, have that ready kind of thing. Um, but, uh, uh, I think it's a fun way to change up, you know, just like kind of create, create some tension in the game and, and have that. Uh, and I, I really liked this idea. Yeah, and uh, having those stats for an elemental, if they would not get it taken care of, yeah. they would be an elemental for a while before they got their new character or before right. you guys figured out how to story-wise mm-hmm. uh, you know, have some wizard begin to pull back part of their mind into this elemental and they yeah. then begin to play as an elemental or whatever. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. I guess they said four weeks, didn't they? So there's a little bit of time there yeah. for them to play, and that's that's interesting. Yeah, that's a good one, though. I I, I did have the question of um, why did the elemental family not break the curse themselves? But I guess they were all elementals at that point, right? So they would have had to like deal with the four weeks of change, and I don't know. That was. 
that may be getting too much in the weeds too, but it's like, I was like, why didn't they figure out how to do (laughs) it? This is something that as GMs, at least Mm -hmm. I, as a GM, I like to like think through that and have, because you know, your players are going to ask that. Mm -hmm. Well, why didn't they just do this? How didn't they know? And you could just hand wave it and be like, well, you know, I don't know, but (laughs) yeah, yeah. It's always fun, more fun to come up with a satisfying reason why they right. didn't. Right. <laughs> they so. were just really dumb. Idiots. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go on to our, our, main, uh, our main topic of the day, cool. and that is tying in PC backstories. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about yeah. um, lore, and we kind of started to edge into this a little bit, but we're going to expand yeah. on what we talked about then. So we may talk a little bit about some of that, but we'll, we're going to expand into this. How do you bring in PC backstories? How do you get the backstories? How do you begin to use those in your game? And how can you make that an integral part of what you guys do besides just combat, combat, combat? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, a lot of times this seems to be some of the most, um, like impactful or like attaching kind of piece of the games is when someone has like brought something up, like this is a part of who I am as a character. And then that gets actually like focused on and, and worked in, in that way. Um, So I think it's really important to, you know, obviously there's different play styles and things, but kind of the, the way that we tend to run our games is having these backstories play a pretty big role. And, yeah. That's going to start with like asking those questions to begin with, right? Like right. as we're beginning the game, um, before we've started, you know, people are making characters, we're having session zero, that kind of stuff. Um, I think having like those specific backstory questions um, is going to help them to form their character, you know, and that's like a big part of it. It's going to help us to know who they are and then start being able to attach um kind of into the story arc as well. So when when you're doing that, Matthew, like are there like specific ways you have gone about that, maybe helping people even begin to make a backstory? So I told you uh all here in the in the podcast audience that I used to sit and make character backstories for characters just because I loved doing it before I ever played the game, just make them over and over. Uh, And for me, it was like fun of imagining who that character was before, you know, and like how they became not there are, uh, I'm always surprised by, there are a lot of groups that don't put a lot of effort into backstory. They're like, Mm -hmm. okay, I'm a dwarf, you know, cleric. Okay. I'm a, I'm an elven archer. Okay. I'm this and that. And they just start playing and it's, and it really becomes about mechanics and their games often feel very shallow to me. I've sat in on a few of them uh, when being in different places, visiting at people's tables. And um, I found that those people uh, who put almost more emphasis on the story. So D&D uh, actually probably always had mechanic for this. But I know like in 5e, they, they do this thing where they're like, your flaws... What are all of those things? There's flaws, yeah. uh, uh, traits, features. There's... Uh, all I know is like my, my current character, he has like, um, I'll always know the plan. Um, or yeah, then you're going to throw it out as soon as you basically, <laughs> I, I'm very eager to like throw the uh, plan out the window. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and don't, don't tell me the odds. I always win sort of, you know? Uh, and so those things, uh, have kind of helped shape who my, my right, player right. is, but, um, I think they that is a step in the direction of having backstories. And I think that the GM who can hesitate, hold off long enough on jumping into the game yeah. to have those sessions uh, and have like in the in between times have questions to ask or have your people write a good solid backstory, mm-hmm. like imagining a lot about who this person is, where they come from, who their family is, how they uh why they're doing any of this, you know, put, answer some of those questions. Right. I think if you make your characters, your, your players kind of do some of that mental work first, mm-hmm. yeah, right. it is so much better. And so in how we've done it in the past, there's times where we'll say, Hey, everybody, I want you to pick your characters and I want you to write your backstories. And that has been 
just due to the fact that many of the people in our games are pretty creative. And so we'll sit there and we'll write these backstories just on our own. Mm. If you don't have that experience and people aren't used to doing that, then you may need to seed them with some questions. Right. Um, and, you know, I act like, oh, I'm so creative. I always make this great backstory. I mean, <laughs> I, we're talking about, uh, we talked last time about this game that I'm in now, and I didn't, you know. Yeah, right. I, I kind of did. I, I made this this character who has like dragonfly wings who flies and uh, he has this like hand cannon thing that flips out of his arm. And, uh, you know, and I had this character and I started playing him partially because we were just kind of doing a one shot that turned into a two shot that turned into a campaign. So I right. didn't put as much into it because I thought, oh, OK, this is a quick character. Here's who I'm going to be. He seems pretty cool. Uh, but then as we went, Adam ask me some pointed questions. And I talked about this last time. He said, yeah, who's right. your family? Um, and I I sat down one day and I, I'm like, who is my family? And mm -hmm. I, I made up this whole thing and you can go back and watch, you know, two weeks ago, uh, that that one uh, on, what was that we were talking about? Oh yeah, uh, lore. lore. Yeah, lore. <laughs> uh, integrating lore. You can watch that one to see like uh, some of the specifics of what I did as far as coming up with who's my father and what's my feelings toward him, who's my older brother and what's the the feelings there and my younger brother and right. why, how has this influenced why I do thieving because I was part of the thieves, you know, the jade masks. And uh, it was my character really doesn't like the idea of stealing from people, but he had to do it to get food on the table for him and his younger brother because right, he was yeah. all but forgotten by the father who was giving all the money uh, for his older brother's education. Because of that, there was hard feelings toward the older brother. There was this going out and doing this occupation that he didn't really like. And at his first chance, he kind of quit, <laughs> as did all yeah, of the right. people in the group. They quit the Thieves Guild, it started <laughs> us all together. But um, even in doing so, it, it was like my character's backstory was that he was always protecting those who couldn't protect themselves, that kind of character. back Again, right, right. all of this came from a very simple question of Adam saying, who's your family? <laughs> yeah, right. And I'm like, huh. And uh, looking a bit more into the why mm -hmm. and how does that influence. And I think those things are so, so important because that's when you begin to like role play. You're yeah, not just right. min-maxing stats to be like the most powerful thing in the world, although I am a pretty powerful character. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're not just doing that. You are, uh, at the same time, now you have some some uh, principles that you yeah, stand right. behind. And it's like, I don't care if that would make me more powerful, if that would make me more money, if that would, do, you know, I, I do things because of this in my life. And uh, I think that's where it really gets interesting and really gets fun for uh, your players, but also for you as a GM. And I think last time, Adam, you kind of started to talk about how that can really affect the story and how you GM the game, what yeah, your players sure. give you. For sure. Yeah, I, I think it I think it really has for me. Um, I want to react more and more to what the what the people at the table are saying is important to them you know kind of thing and i have that arc still and there's that story in my mind and an end result um uh taylor actually was talking who had asked some questions about cr you know recently I was having a conversation and the continuing conversation about that and uh um that idea of like what's the day-to-day -day look like as you're heading towards a goal you know like what's session by session look like as you're going to the end point that you're hoping for. And I, I feel like that I like to grab onto those stories that people are, are giving and talking about and getting excited about, um, to help. I don't know. I just, I think it makes a richer game for us when we do that. Um, there's a, a lot of, you know, that just like initial creation stuff. I, if you're like, I don't even know where to start, you know, there are so many, lists and tables um i know we've used different ways to help that happen the idea of like the flaws and the uh um the boons and like that that kind of stuff is a good way to think through it or just like motivation things we talked about like the red markets idea of like what's your soft spot or weak spot or tough spot you know kind of depending on the the game you're playing um there's different ways to look at it but just starting to ask questions and um a thing that I haven't done 
I think as well as I'd like um, either is, uh, but I was thinking about this week with this is um, like letting players know the campaign premise to a certain extent, you know, not, not in mine's so weird because I talk about these things, but it's like, I had no idea about anything when we started, but um, not like, Oh, there's going to be a Titan that's bound and there's a God that's trying to un chain it and blah, 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 blah. Like not saying that kind of stuff, but even just giving like a really general idea of this is kind of where you're at. Um, And maybe I did that where it was like, Hey, you guys are starting in the thieves guild. There's going to be some lower jobs, but then this is probably going to expand out to something a little more drastic, you know, kind of thing. So letting people know that so they can even build backstory within the world to some ways and not, not just going from like, Oh, I thought we just had a clean slate, but now I've made up all this stuff and it doesn't even fit in the world. You know, I'm a, Mm -hmm. my whole backstory about how I am descended from fire elementals and can burn everything. And Oh wait, this is an underwater campaign. Oh shoot. You know, kind of thing. You don't, you don't want that stuff. Um, unless that's the drama of it. Um, but uh, I think that's important um, to ask those questions. And again, you can find, I, I I searched, I just like Googled earlier, like character backstory creation questions. And there's like a thousand Reddit article or like threads that people are <laughs> writing to give that, you know, there's, right. there's people, um, I tend to do that if I need to ask some questions and can't, can't like come up with them on my own. Um, a thing I really liked, and I do want to, you know, ask kind of again, Matthew, about like ways you've done that. But um, a thing I saw recently, and I wish I could attribute this. I cannot remember who this was. I'm going to try to find it and at least share it on our socials. But one of the things they brought out, this wasn't actually for the character to make, but it was about players making things about other characters, was this idea of rumors that you had heard about the other person. Like as you were started. And I thought that was a really interesting way to kind of dig into some of this stuff of just backstory and like even what people have like heard and whether it was true or not, you can kind of work out with the, with the players, you know, as it goes, but it was like writing a rumor. Everybody wrote a rumor about the other players or the other characters in their party. Yeah. And then you worked with the players. So like, you know, the other four guys would have written stuff about Eliakim, Matthew's character. And then I sit down with Matthew and I'm like, okay, which of these, like, which of the three out of these four are true or two out of the four. And we know that, and it kind of helps us to build things, but they may have some things in their brain about, oh yeah, he, you know, killed a 17 Buffalo with a bear with his bare hands, you know, and it's like, well, that wasn't true, but I'm going to let it. <laughs> They're like, anyway. we don't believe that. I'm like all. <laughs> making up crazy stuff, but, um, uh, he made that up himself. That yeah. rumor. <laughs> yeah. I, that's a thing that like I have not done, but I'm like, that is getting tucked away because I really like that idea for just like the backstory kind of start to things. But, um, I've used lists a lot and you've talked about some other things. Are there like specific kind of questions or things that you've used? Yeah, I uh, I was trying to find before we started this podcast, I had a, uh, a PDF or a chart or document of some sort that was connections. And we've kind of talked about this before. And uh, it they I, have, I would have each character would have connections with two other characters at the table and they would roll in the chart for what that connection was. And so they would roll. We sat down the first night and I'm like, okay, uh, you, and so I basically I did who's to your right and who's to your left. You roll and that's your connection to them. And so, uh, like I, I know that, um, Brandon's character knew something secret about you. And yeah, one right. of the things that you did was you kept him close because he knew something about you. Yep, that's and, right. Uh, yeah. And and those worked out. And I'm trying to remember the others off the top of my head. I wish I could find that chart. But again, there's yeah. so many charts uh, that you can find that help you with this kind of thing. This idea of being able to, um, I love that rumor idea uh, because it's, these are things that have, you know, you start, it gives you a start, but um, you have to, work those things out and flesh those things out. And so having your your people have something to start with, I, that idea of the rumor being like, oh, people think this. 
I never would have thought about that, but that could be really cool with my character. I am going to right, make that right. true. And here's how it came about. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, a big thing, whether it's coming from a chart or coming from a question of your own, is to encourage your players to sit down and imagine between sessions. Yeah, for That's sure. where things are going to get so full um, because then they're going to come in eager to begin being that person they imagine. You know, we, we talked about like, okay, I want you to imagine a very specific vignette. We always got, talked about these vignettes. Uh, a scene where you are encountering the the family that you you know went to live with when their son died <laughs> that was one of the my things my character did once uh he was a changeling and he actually pretended to be their son for i forget how long they didn't even know but he didn't have the heart to tell them that their son was dead and so i like made this whole little scene it made me love that character we only played for like a session or two i still love that character uh, but it's that idea that i would have never done that had i not sat down between and made some creative time. And for some people, this is going to be like uh, right up their alley. And for some people, it's going to be hard. They're going to be like, I don't know. I don't know how to write a scene, you know, and that's where as a GM, you're going to have to kind of hold their hand through some of the beginning part of that. But when they get, when they get into it, I've, I've, I've yet to find somebody who didn't really like their character more after doing that, you know, and we've had some that yeah, like, right. would sit down and write a book and we'd have some who'd sit down and write bulleted lists and I'd have to kind of help flesh those bulleted lists out into like more of a story for them. But again, yeah, I'd encourage right. them, do it more like a story. Do it more like you're writing a story. And oh, they they end up enjoying that process, but also then acting that character out way more than if they would have just said, oh yeah, my character, you know, he has a hard time with authority. Well, okay, that's fine. But what does that look like? I want you to write a story for me of a time when you were minding your own business and authority came along and this show me how that plays out and write the story for me right right <laughs> you know and when they do that that becomes a bedrock part of them much more than if they said i my character has a hard time with authority you know that can be very one-dimensional and and you know just a statement yeah right so yeah yeah as i don't even remember if i answered what you asked but <laughs> no it was good it was good it was really good um, a thing that um, I uh, think on here, like, you know, is like, okay, somebody may be listening to this and they're like, well, we're like halfway through a campaign, but I've never really dealt with, dealt with this, you know, and um, I don't think, you know, if that's, again, people play differently and that may not be a thing that your table wants, but if you're wanting to dive into that, uh, which I, I do agree what Matthew said, like, people love their, their characters, I think all the more for having built those things. Um, uh, like it's not too late to do that, you know, right. to like jump in and, um, to ask those questions in the middle of a game, um, to, you know, a lot of times Matthew brought that up, but like just sending somebody a question like, Hey, talk to me about the family. Talk to me about why you left your homeland. Tell me, what's your biggest phobia as a character, you know, like, like all this, these kind of things can, can help develop that. Yeah. Um, and it's not too, it's never too late to like add more detail to that. Um, I really like the idea of like helping, um, as like the party's moving about the world with whatever they're doing to like, let the, the path of that story to cross backstory um sometimes it's like intentional um so matthew your your eliakim character there there has been some intentionality of like i'm going to find my brother like that was you were yeah. you were invested in that i didn't have to like push to make you the the push was well he's been captured and taken but then you you made the decision of what you were going to do and you the party went to um to the capital and dealt with your older brother first and then went after that. Um, but that was, you know, that was more intentional on your part, but I think sometimes um, going back to like the Torgan idea from two weeks ago that I talked about, that is more, I kind of put the place, I'm like, we're kind of in the same location of where I thought this was to begin with. So they're going to literally legitimately cross through his backstory 
and there's going to be able to be some scenes happen there and maybe even bigger things happen. It looks like probably what's going to happen is we'll come back to it and there'll be more story happen from there. But I, I like that idea of like letting the path of the adventure cross backstory. And yeah. that could be location, which is kind of the Torgan thing of like, I've put you in your home. I've put you in this place that was really developmental for the character. I've, whatever that is, you're now crossing, you know, walking past the prison that you were in for however many years, or it could be crossing the paths of an NPC. So it's like, you know, you're in a foreign country, but for some reason you see your like best friend from growing up is somehow walking down the road. Like what is, there's going to be things you have to deal with, with your backstory when that happens. Um, or even like sometimes even like a memory trigger, uh, you smell the the smell of honey and chamomile and it takes you back to when you were a child and your mother, you know, like there, there's like that stuff that I think can happen too in story. It's a little more um, ambiguous and you can kind of play with, but um, I like that idea of like letting the path of the adventure cross backstory in ways and um, let the, like the character development happen in that. Um, because I think like, when the PCs can kind of deal with their past that like helps to bring about more things. I, I felt that as a character, at least as a player, you know, like being able to like, Oh, I'm dealing with this situation that was part of my backstory. Now I have to like grapple with all the things that are going on there. And would, you know, Cormac be having a bunch of emotion about this as he, sees a family walking down the street when he has lost his family, you know, like that, that kind of thing too. So um, I, I like that of just like putting that in front of people and, and seeing where it goes. Yeah. And uh, it's fun, even as a GM, sometimes to twist, mm -hmm. to twist their backstory and uh, just see what they do, how they react. Yeah. So for instance, I told you uh, Aramis Belathon was a changeling who lived, he had his best friend um, was, killed by some group of monsters and he couldn't get there in time to save it, which is one reason he decided to like fight these things. But he, he just felt so bad for the parents because this was their only son and they were older and they barely could have children and he didn't know how to tell them. So he just pretended to be their son for a long time right. and then like went away to this call of arms, you know, as their son. <laughs> yeah, um, right because he couldn't figure out how to how to bring up how to do this without breaking their heart and he loved them so much and so if later in that which that that campaign didn't go on but like if later in that campaign you know we're fighting and we're on this castle and there's a mob who's coming and you know we're trying to keep this castle from being overrun and i look down and i see his mom in this crowd um, yeah. and, or if, you know, something happens and someone that I think is going to be uh, a horrible person, someone who, who could have done this and it ends up being his dad, mm -hmm. <laughs> I put, you, you've put me in a conundrum because I love right, these people yeah, so yeah. much. And now, right. you know, or, uh, I want to help this mom who is in this mob that I don't think is doing right. And you know, right. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you can take those things and kind of, it's like in, uh, Sentinels of the multiverse, you can do the twist. You know, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. What was that called? Was it just a twist, or it was like a major something and a minor? Yeah, something? minor twist or major twist. Yeah, oh, there you go. <laughs> I, yeah. was, I was really close, wasn't I? <laughs> uh, and like, uh, you know, you can you can say, okay, this will succeed, but there's a twist. What is that twist? And right, you have the player yeah. come up with it, and then sometimes mm, that yeah. can really lead your. Uh, yeah. All of this, I think, um, I started to. Uh, I had a thought from a, a moment ago and I forgot what it was. So I'm just going to let it go. But all of this, uh, all of this can really not only help your player love their player more, uh, love their character more, but it can help influence and dictate where you as the GM take the game. Right. Yeah. I, I think that's, again, we talk about it all the time, cooperative story building. Mm -hmm. That's what makes this fun. It's not you just telling a story and them just living through it. It's you guys building it together. And right, yeah. uh, I remembered what I was going to say, and that is uh, I talked about how that backstory can make a player love their character more and really get into their character more. But uh, he was uh, Adam was talking about having characters cross their backstory, mm -hmm. knowing other characters' backstory and watching that come out in the game 
makes changes me in yeah. how I relate to that character and how much I care for that character too. Right. And so don't forget that uh, building in these moments of character backstory that are revealed not only is good for your character, but it builds your group cohesion, builds your group purpose, yeah, that's and really good. Uh, changes the way that they're going to fight for each other or not fight for each other or hate each other, <laughs> whatever it is. Right. Um, that That's huge. And so I kind of want to come to this idea of spotlighting. Um mm. So you have characters, all of them have a backstory. You can't just all the time be talking about all of them. How yeah. do you handle that, Adam, when you're running? Yeah. Game? Yeah. Um, being aware <laughs> of the time spent is a big piece for me, you know, of, of that. I, and I think like making sure that it's not, that it does get passed around. I mean, we have talked about that in like a, more of like an encounter kind of realm. And I do think that that from where I'm standing, it kind of, it, it fits in the same way. It's just a broader aspect. So um, I tend to almost think in terms of arcs and my arcs may be smaller than maybe other people that have you, you know, if you're thinking in those terms of like, you know, we talked about the session and the arc and the campaign. Um, but like in this game, and I, I know I've brought it up before and we've talked about it even now, it's like like Eliakim's brother being captured and this kind of chase to find him and rescue him. I see that as like an arc and it's not all like focused on Eliakim, but Eliakim is kind of the prominent story from like a personal level as far as like from basically the moment you got to the capital, talk to your older brother and have moved. But even in the midst of that, there's stuff with Ozoff, you know, there's stuff that could have happened on uh, the quay, you know, with this, this floating Island that he may have had attachments to or not, you know, kind of thing. Um, there's, movement now we're going into the underdark we were in the underdark and now there's these connections to uh leonis's character and he's gonna have to grapple with his background and people that he hasn't seen in 20 years you know kind of thing um so i want to keep it moving you know kind of thing and not not just like focus in completely we had the torgan situation um so i just try to be aware i guess of like who has not been, who has not been spotlit recently? Um, as I'm talking through that, I feel like like a vast majority of the group has been spotlighted in some way. Um, but sometimes I think of like broader arcs to like help move them. Um, a lot of stuff at the beginning was more Ozoff related because it was like his city that he had been a guard in. He knew the people in the prison, that kind of thing. Um, and then Pip got a little more spotlit and then Torgan got spotlit as he met with some more half orcs. You know, I, I just try to try to keep that moving and not, not forget people in that kind of realm. So that's the like basic, not super scientific idea of how I do that. <laughs> so yeah. And how, how do you think it's about very, that? It, and it's very important. Like uh, I, I don't think there's a whole lot more complication to that. I think it's being mm -hmm. aware as a GM that you're not focusing on one person whose story you like. And therefore right. you and that person are playing a really fun game and everybody else is kind of along for the ride, feeling mm -hmm. like they're worthless and not as right, important. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Just like you want to like feature uh, as a hero in the battle, each player at some point, you also right. want to feature emotionally and relationally what's going on. Um, I'm excited uh, in the game you're running because we've just gone into the Underdark. And so we've had this idea that Leonis is from the Underdark, but he's not really like, part of that or doesn't want yeah, to be part right. of that. But like, as far as me knowing where he's a very secretive person, who's always like keeping his secrets and being off by himself. Mm -hmm. And at the beginning of the campaign, that made me kind of feel like that Leonis. Uh, but as we get more and more into this, I'm hoping that we get more understanding of the internal struggle. And uh, right, again, right. I think as much as that'll help him kind of tie into the game, it'll help us tie into him and his character. Uh, yeah, for sure. So, yeah, it's about that spreading it around uh, mm -hmm. and uh, 
just what it sounds like spotlighting you know you're yeah. turning that spotlight on and turning it off and it doesn't have to be every every cam every uh session doesn't have to be a spotlight sometimes it can just be like general but yeah. you do want to think like adam was talking about a couple of weeks ago you do want to like think okay in the way that i'm like is there a piece of lore that's going to be dropped here is there a right. is there a person that i'm thinking more in terms of and that doesn't mean you like exclude everybody else but they're going to be the spotlight yeah and i one thing i just want to toss into the mix too is like if you're a player you know listening to this like there there's a really cool aspect of like encouraging that yeah. also and being like willing to okay this is obviously a little more focused on this person so i'm gonna i'm gonna like observe and actually engage but i don't have to be the spotlight but also i'm not gonna go get on my phone and you know right catch up on my emails while this is happening because i want to be like interested and like connected in that way and I, I think that that's a really that's one of those player etiquette things that i want to talk about more at some point but just like we can like be for the other the other players the other characters and like engage in that way too um, and I, I, I'm really happy. I love that, that like, I feel like people are like grabbing that in the games that we play in. Um, but I, I think that can happen sometimes where it's like, oh, this is about, you know, this is about Chris. So I'm just gonna kind of tap out for a little while, but it's like, no, we're going to all be invested. And I, I really appreciated that, you know, just in this recent one with Torgan, I did feel like, and maybe it was because we hadn't got a ton of backstory, but I felt like everyone was like, oh, like what's <laughs> like what's the situation happening? Who's this right. guy he's talking to? You know, so they um, leaned in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a really cool player practice as well as to like engage with that thing um from the side and be able to encourage it too. And then lastly, uh, on this topic before we run to the NPC, I want to say that as a GM, do your best to take things from people's backstory and tie them to the main purpose of the game yep. in some way, uh, because uh, that's what's going to make it feel epic instead of like any, any human with two legs could be in this place as long as they could fight well. Uh, instead, you make it feel like there is something prophetic and special and unique in the universe about the fact that I was one of the people that is in this place uh, that for your for your players, uh, when you can make it so that uh, only this exact party could have done the ultimate challenge, that feels so much cooler. That's Star Wars, you know. Luke was the one who had to be there. It wasn't just Red Red Wedge One or whatever his name was. <laughs> you know, it's not just any guy on an X wing that could blow up the Death Star. Luke feeling the Force because yeah, right, right. the prophecy of it all. You know, him coming in there. Uh, you want them to feel that way, and so uh, finding a way to connect to the story that they made up and bringing that, and they get to the end and they're like, "Oh wow." it had to be somebody who was this kind of person and that's me, you know? Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. That, that can be powerful, powerful stuff Absolutely. Uh, as a GM. So yeah, yeah you, you'll good. get a module that says this is how a game is supposed to end. Uh, and yeah, you'll get campaigns that take you through like a bunch of sessions with fights and with some skill checks and all that, but you can get to the end and feel like well, that was like meh. Or you can take that very thing and have your characters write a backstory mm -hmm. and pull elements of that backstory into and weave them into the story yourself. When you get to the end, it's going to feel like so much more than just a campaign you bought off of a shelf. Yeah. Yep. So Love anyway, it. let's jump to our NPC. Uh, am I the NPC this week? Man, I better yep. get my NPC <laughs> up here because I think I was still uh, on our Eureka yeah. Oh, encounter yeah. here. Okay, yeah. so our NPC this week is a sadistic priest named Yezra Darkmorn. Mm. Um, I'm going to describe first, and then we'll kind of talk about how she is. Uh, tall, imposing woman, Yezra prefers dark clothes, usually uh, a leather jerkin, wide-brimmed hat. She wears her red hair and a long, single, triple-knotted braid. That's typical of her order. So her order, you're going to find out, uh, has a very specific purpose. Uh, she has a scar, quote, tattoo uh, of the goddess on her right cheek. 
Um, he kind of wonder how she got that. It doesn't look like a professional tattooist, did it? Uh, and she rarely smiles. Uh, she's blunt and to the point. She imposes punishments on those who have not paid uh, their full tithe to the church of the goddess. And you would be like, what's the church of the goddess? Well, let's read on. Uh, she dismisses sob stories with a wave of her hand. She tells her victims what punishments await them, and she seems happy to do this. She acts the part of the cold arbiter, meeting out proper punishments, but secretly she enjoys inflicting pain and often adds additional charges to her victims just for the opportunity to dole out more punishment. Uh, she is a sadist and enjoys watching people suffer. Her background, uh, the goddess, and you get to decide who the goddess is right, in the yeah. campaign, but the goddess grants miracles in return for tithe. So a very money-oriented goddess, right? Uh, but if members fail to pay the tithe, she sends a collector. And that's what this, uh, what's her name again? Ye Yezra? <laughs> that's what Yezra is. She's one of the collectors for this goddess. Um, so they send a collector. Collectors are given autonomous authority to make delinquent worshipers pay. And if they can't, the collector punishes them with an anti-miracle or what we might call a curse, <laughs> right? Uh, this anti-miracle <laughs> that will happen. Uh, Yezra particularly enjoys her work, especially when it causes others to suffer. And those closest to her speculate that Yezra was a victim of the goddess before she became a collector herself. And so she might say something like, the goddess has blessed you with a good yield and you fall short in your tithe. I assure you that you will repay, she'll repay you in kind when a plague comes to your house. And then she s turns on her heel and leaves, and everybody in the place is like, oh, no, oh, no. we're in a plague. <laughs> so it seems like uh, this goddess actually does magic. Mm. And that, uh, so I had to put this together in my head when I was first reading this. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. okay, so what kind, of, what kind of place is this? Does everybody in the town have to pay tithes? Or is it just if they choose to worship this goddess? And why would they right. choose to uh, if they didn't have the money? Well, right, yeah. I think the way I would come about this as a GM is uh, people, uh, this is not just a town or that worships this goddess, mm. but like they're spread out all over. And it's people come to this goddess who want a miracle and she grants those miracles. But then for life, you have to tithe. This is just me coming. Yeah, yeah, you could change yeah, it, make right. it anything you want. But for life, you have to tithe her. And these collectors come around then. And at some point, as people's fortunes go up and down and they can't pay the tithe, then they're visited with these anti-miracles. And it's these collectors who have the power to like bring that down. The goddess right, has given right. all the power to these collectors. And so I see them as feared people. Uh, and people don't go lightly into worshiping this goddess and asking for the first miracle because they've seen these examples of uh, what can happen, and yet people cannot help themselves when it comes to like getting something they want now. And so you have these yeah, people yeah. part of this, you know, um, worship of this goddess, whatever this goddess is in your world, uh, and she is a recognized part of this society. And, and people know that if they chose to take this miracle, then there's going to be punishments. That, and so you come across her. And it's not like she is a, someone that your party has to do away with because she's doing her job. Does she take right. joy in it? Yes. Is she like uh, tall, like a, a, a switch that, that comes and punishes people? Yes. Is she enjoy that sadistically? Yes. But is she like outside of any legal bounds? No. Um, this part of the temple, people know going into this. Uh, so this is the way I yeah, would write right. this this yeah. person in. And how would they? How would my characters interact with somebody like this? I don't know. <laughs> I'd have to right. think about this one. Like, why would they even be uh, interacting with her in the first place? And what kind of interaction would that be? Mm -hmm. uh, assuming none of my characters, I would assume none of them went to, to the goddess for a miracle, but maybe somebody in their backstory did, and now they're having to to like negotiate with her to keep her from calling an anti uh, miracle a curse on, yeah, on this right, person right. that is going to come true because of the the power of the goddess or maybe it is something that leads our our characters to fight a goddess I don't know uh, but it would be an interesting NPC uh, it would depend on you know the situation and how the campaign was going is there anything when you read this or as I described it you thought oh, this might be a, a way that this NPC is in the campaign. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I like the way that you, um, yeah, you spoke into that. Uh, I did like that there's some gaps there 
with this that you know you can make your own calls on how to what deity or whatever or if it's just like this kind of more generic the goddess and you don't really even know a name um i find that to be helpful you know in that and i do i do really like this idea of it's someone that like makes you kind of feel the ick here but also it's, it's like not like it, yeah it's like it's like this is part of this like it's a part of a situation that's like accepted you know and it's not like oh well we're gonna just like fight in the streets until one of us is dead kind of situation you know i think that's she doesn't even seem like that kind of person there's there's a lot of like fear this feels very fear based as far as like the way that this like uh temple kind of situation would work and um it'd be interesting to see like okay well if there's not fear how do they relate to that person it's just you know is it just going to be like well she just just ignores them <laughs> if the party if the party isn't gonna like cow to her then well it's like well you don't really exist to me anyway because you're not part of this and um, i think this has to be uh you know, you can make the goddess whatever you want. I love the idea of a goddess who's like the, you know, the 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 statue of justice with the scales. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, right. The idea that you you will be given a miracle, mm -hmm. boom. Yeah. And you've got to pay tithes for the rest of right. your life in order yeah. to to have this. Uh, and if you don't, boom, it's going to go the other way. You know, right. Uh, yeah, yeah. And yeah. so I think you have to tie this NPC into somebody they care about not just coming to the party because your party could just be like, who cares? But if yeah. in fact, you know, she's warning them, this person you're working for has been seen at the temple. And I would advise you to caution them greatly before they choose to take a miracle. Right. Because yeah. they don't seem like the kind of people who could pay or mm. keep up with, you know, and she could be yeah, like yeah. very stern right. and not necessarily against your PCs warning them you know so she's she's this lawful she takes a, right. a a joy in in punishing people but at the same time she may uh she may you know interact with your characters yeah, yeah. i don't know <laughs> so don't know. this is like maybe out of what we normally do but for a symbol i'm liking the just or the uh the scales of justice with the goddess placing the miracle in one side and below the other side is just a bunch of figures like trying to hold up the the scale to oh. keep it even i'm like really liking that so yeah need to draw that out here <laughs> draw that out <laughs> trying to keep uh, it balanced again, some some of your world building can yeah, come right. in this kind yeah. of thing yeah so. yeah it's, I, I i do like these like more neutral you know, even though there is like a sadism there, you know, like it's not a villain necessarily, even if they may think of her that way kind of deal. And um, I think that that's really interesting to like, just add into the games and have that. I, I had a, I had a group, which you guys did end up fighting, but um, there was a group of, uh, they were, um, oh shoot. It's blood, uh, like blood mages. I can't think of the right word for it, but um, it's a 5e thing. Um, and I know what they you're were, talking about. I can't think of it yeah, either. <laughs> it's, a, it's actually a Matt Mercer creation that 5e uses. But the, uh, um, uh, yeah, anyway, we'll move you're still on. still trying um, to think of it. <laughs> the, they were, there were some of them that were like werewolf hunters and that kind of right. connected into the time when, um, and I, I think of them a little bit, they were a little bit farther because they actually started causing people to be werewolves so they could have job security basically. <laughs> um, oh, and yeah. you know, they were, they were making that happen because they had a bit of sadism in themselves, but also some other stuff going on. So, um, but they I forgot, I have their orders from the king to do yeah. whatever they need to do to do yeah, this and that's right yeah <laughs> i have those in my back <laughs> um but that it kind of reminds me of that especially you you all's first interaction with them was um was uh i think you were like walking through a town and they had like somebody pushed up against a wall in an alley yep. like interrogating them and you're like hey what's going on here and they're like it's no none of your business and I'm this like, I'm making of, it my like, business yeah. <laughs> because I'm a PC. Yeah. That's what I do. 
So yeah, that, that, that reminds me of this a little bit. And I like that, the, that did escalate, but I could see this just being a part of the background of like, this is not right. And maybe this is going to increase into something else, but, um, I, I like her too. And I kind of like the idea of there being temples in the town that you just don't agree with, but that doesn't mean that they're not there. You know, I think in our early yeah, yeah. games, we used to have like uh, temples of Tiamat that would be in these towns, you know, nobody yeah. likes Tiamat, <laughs> but there are temples and there are worshipers there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, this goddess might not be a goddess you feel very good about right, and yeah, her yeah. enforcers might not be ones you feel very good about, but it's part of the society. It's part of culture. It's right, part right. of the world. So yeah, it's good stuff. Good stuff. All right. Well, I do believe we are coming to the end of this episode. And so we're going to finish here for this time. Uh, we've got another one here in a couple weeks going to drop. And the, in a couple weeks, we're going to revisit the idea of character death and talk a little bit more about yeah. that uh, here. So join us as we do that on Rise of the GM. And uh, it's going to be good when we get back here live and in person. So till that time, you guys yep. stay strong as GMs. We'll catch you next time. Thanks Thanks for joining us.